I'll be reading from the Gospel of Luke. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. Because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. You may have a seat. As the winter winds start to whisper and the world transforms around us, surrounded by the warmth of our homes, the twinkle of lights, and the songs of the season, it's a time of anticipation, of joyful preparation for something extraordinary is about to happen. Gazing upon the same starry skies that shone bright on that miraculous night, we remember the greatest arrival of all time. Christmas isn't just a season, it's a proclamation of hope, a reminder of a promise fulfilled. So this Advent, as we celebrate the birth of our Savior, let us also prepare our hearts for His glorious return. For just as the first Christmas brought hope to a broken world, the promise remains, the King is coming. Good morning. So grateful to be a part of a church where we value things like that. Did that give you chills? Me too. I saw it a month ago and it still gives me chills right now. So here we go. I'm sitting in the middle of goodness, yet I'm feeling confused, frustrated, and maybe a little bit angry. It was Christmas about five or six years ago. My family was together, and the presents had been exchanged. Plans were made. We're Northwesterners, so we had had good food and good coffee through the time together. Do you guys, is that a thing? Okay, all right. Good food, good coffee, good company. We had talked about politics and survived. Everything was going really well. And where we're, kids are playing, they're laughing. It's like a Hallmark movie moment, you know, in real life. But I'm sitting there at the table in the middle of all the goodness, and I'm feeling confused, and I'm frustrated, and I'm asking myself, is this all there is? Is this all there is for Christmas and Advent in this time of year? See, my problem was Christmas had moved into the realm of cliche for me. Or maybe I was identifying it had always been there. You see, the definition of cliche is a phrase or opinion that is overused and betrays a lack of original thought. Now, Christmas for me was not overused. I'm a big fan of Christmas, always have been. Big fan of Amy Grant and Mariah Carey as well. Bring them on. Look forward to it every year. But like a cliche, Christmas for me was losing its original power. It was losing its original meaning. Or again, maybe I was recognizing I had never known it. So I'm sitting there in the middle of a family gathering. Everyone else is having a good time. And it's like that slow motion moment where I'm identifying like, oh, I'm not having a good time. I was asking myself, is this all there is? Is there something more that I am missing? You see, Christmas is a time that's actually full of a lot of activity and distraction, a lot of good things, but those good things can distract us from the main thing. And I recognized that day that my tension I was feeling was actually birthed in tension about me. It wasn't anyone else's fault, it was me. I had made room for rest. I had taken time off to be with family and to not work. I had made room for people, planned with family, friends, and relatives to coordinate being together. 
I had made room for gifts, budgeted for my wife's gifts, my kids' gifts, and others, made intentional time and energy for all of those things to happen. I had made room for all these things. But I had not made room for Jesus at all. And I think this Christmas thing is about Jesus. Christmas is about Emmanuel, which is one of the names of Jesus, which means God with us. But I was recognizing I had spent no time being with God in my life or in my time or with my energy. And I wonder for some of you, when the wrapping paper has hit the floor and you're sitting on the couch taking that deep breath about to clean up, have you asked yourself the same question? Is there this all there is? Now, for those of you who are new to church, the Advent season is not just us as Christians extending Christmas because we love it so much. Advent is a month-long season where we intentionally enter into the waiting and the tension and even the pain of what it was like on this world before Jesus Christ came to the earth. That's what Advent is all about. We are intentionally entering into longing and pain and tension to put our hearts and our minds back in that place so then we can feel what they felt back then and then we can feel again the longing for Jesus to come again now. That is what Advent is all about. The title of my teaching today is Prepare Him Room. This is a phrase that comes from the song we just sang, Joy to the World, that hymn written by Isaac Watts. I want to reread for you the, the first stanza that we sang together so with reading you can maybe feel it in a different way. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. I thought about singing that to you guys, but I wanted you guys to have a good Christmas and Advent season, so. (laughs) Let every heart prepare him room. This is in reference to our text today in Luke 2, where Jesus is being born and there is no room for him at the end. Very familiar scripture. And as we talk about and think about preparing him room and what does that mean, I want to offer us just a couple themes today to meditate on together as a community that will hopefully set a course for us to enter into Advent free from cliche and enter into Christmas experiencing its original power and intent. Does that sound good? Well, you have no choice, so I hope it sounds good for you. Like any good Christmas sermon, I want to talk about the problem of evil. That was a joke, but buckle up. We're going to talk about the problem of evil. Years ago, a young man named Jay Austin and a young woman named Lauren Gagan, who were two, uh, a couple, decided they wanted to mountain bike through the world. They were blogging about their experiences, their writing together. They had done this for over a year. I admire it. I don't think I understand riding a bike for a year, but I do have to say I admire it. And they were going through country after country, experiencing all these different cultures and places, and they're approaching on their mountain bikes, this guy and this gal together, the Middle East. And one of their friends or family members objects to them saying, hey, I don't know if it's wise to go into Iraq or Afghanistan, you and your girlfriend on a bike. And Jay Austin in his blog says this in response before they entered in, badness exists, sure, but even that's quite rare. By and large, humans are kind, self-interested sometimes, myopic sometimes, but kind, generous and wonderful and kind. Jay and Lauren entered into Afghanistan, and shortly after they entered in, they were run down by five members of ISIS and stabbed to death. Now, I don't share this story to dishonor them whatsoever. There's actually some truth to what Jay is saying. But the core of what he's saying is a misguided understanding of the human heart. That the human heart is basically good and kind. When in reality, in the real world, which they unfortunately experienced, the human heart is dark. 
the human heart is dark. They were given a wrong diagnosis about how this world works, where Jesus gives a crippling diagnosis. Here's what Jesus says about our human condition in John 3, 19. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. Let's pause here for a second. Jesus is saying that people can not only align with evil, agree with evil, but that we love evil. Gentle, mild Jesus is saying that. Billion dollar child and sex trafficking organizations, also known as the pornography industry. Billion dollar war industries where men in boardrooms are licking their lips as blood spills on the streets of other places. Epidemics we are and have lived through of hatred, fear, anxiety, division, and suicide. That's in Portland. Abortion numbers so high that the numbers have eclipsed every casualty count of any war, plague, or natural disaster in human history in our country. And loneliness as now a medical, physical epidemic of our country. Welcome to the real world. This is our world. And to understand the power of Advent and Christmas is to face that world and identify that is the world that Jesus chose to come to. It's this world. Fleming Rutledge, she says this, Advent is the season that, when properly understood, does not flinch from the darkness that stalks us all in this world. Advent begins in the dark and moves towards the light, but the season should not move too quickly or too glibly, lest we fail to acknowledge the depth of the darkness. As our Lord Jesus tells us, unless we see the light of God clearly, what we call light is actually darkness. How great is that darkness? Advent bids us take a fearless inventory of the darkness, the darkness without and the darkness within. I think every Christmas movie I've ever seen in the last 10 years, the climax of the movie is everyone standing around a Christmas tree singing some vague song about how we've rediscovered the goodness of humankind, just sitting there waiting to be found. Oh, we've got it. We've got it wrong. We've missed it. This world is dark. It is full of evil. Christmas and Advent invite us to meditate and sit and face that evil. And then the invitation is to sit a bit longer to recognize, like every great mind in history, regardless of faith, that the evil out there has its roots and same sickness to the evil right here. That is the invitation of Christmas and Advent. If you've ever talked to someone who is not a believer, I've even talked to believers who, who rightly wrestle through this question. Why would a just and loving God send people to hell? Has anyone ever heard that question before? It's a good question. But Advent, if we, if we pause to see our world and, and we pause to see the world that Jesus came to, the better question is this. Why wouldn't a loving and just God destroy us all because of our own desire for hell? I think that is a better, more honest question if we are being honest about our hearts in the world in which we live. But God did not only not destroy us, he came here. You see, our faith is not a feel-good Hallmark movie. I love watching those movies don't get me wrong. But our faith is not that. Our faith is about Jesus who came to this world, who 2,000 years ago, believe it or not, the world he entered into was way darker than our world now. And because Jesus was born into this world, he decided to enter into our darknesses and enter into our hells. That is what is happening, what we're celebrating 
during Advent and Christmas. Why am I getting all Eeyore with you? Why am I spending so much time here? This is all important because for many of us, we've grown up in faith traditions or families of origin where the Jesus or the faith that we were given was just fake. The Jesus you were modeled would only talk about the weather. The Jesus you were modeled only ever said, I'm fine, I'm fine. The Jesus you were modeled was, was never facing the darkness so he could redeem the darkness. And this kind of Jesus is powerless in the real world. And we need to be a people moving with the real Jesus who moves in power against the darkness of our world, not running from it. That is why this is important. One of my favorite, this is top 10 movies for me, is M. Night Shyamalan's The Village. Anyone seen it? It's a scary movie. Don't watch it with your little kids, okay? You've been warned, so don't email me if your kids start crying, okay? <laughs> the Village, it, um, the director, M. Night Shyamalan, this is before, I don't know, something happened to that guy. He just started making bad ones. But there was a chunk there where he started making really good ones, and The Village is one of my favorite. The Village is all about a small village of people. And you open into the movie, and you think, oh, the setting of this story is probably four or 500 years ago in America. It's olden times. But the reveal of the movie, yes, I'm going to spoil it. You've had 20 years. The reveal of the movie is this. No, no, actually, the setting of the movie is in modern times. And everyone in this village has removed themselves from modern society because the elders of the village all of which had experienced deep hurt and pain in the real world, were trying to remove themselves from the world of darkness. But the reality of the movie, as, as the movie so beautifully portrays, is they can't run from darkness because darkness isn't here. They've brought darkness with them to this idyllic community because they brought people into this community. Humans can't escape the problem of evil because it's in our hearts where the problem of evil lives. That's the whole point of the movie. But the incarnation is so important because unlike moving away from darkness, Jesus more moves to it. That's the power of the incarnation. Jesus didn't see evil and move away to Texas or Idaho. <laughs> Too soon. He moves towards it. And so in this vein, I want to just say something for you to consider. What a great opportunity it is to live in Gresham in Portland. Have you ever heard someone say that in the last 20 years? What a great opportunity we have living where we do. What a great darkness we live in so Jesus' light can shine that much brighter. That is the incarnation, Jesus moving to darkness to bring light, not running from it, because he is greater. That is the incarnation. I've got three kids, and I've, we had all our kids in Portland, and because we're living in Portland in 2023, and we live in the Portland area, we heard a lot from people why would anyone bring a child into this world? Now, I think, I think there's a lot of parents in the room because I've walked by the children's ministry. Maybe you have heard this as well. Why would anyone bring a child into this world? I think this phrase is rooted in an ethos and a belief system that's deeply dark, but it's often said out of personal pain. And if we pause, we can say, actually, there's some truth to, or at least some legitimacy to the question, because of what we just said, this world is so dark, why would you bring a child into it? There's some fairness to the concern. But the incarnation asks this question. Why would God become a child and move into this world? That's the question of Christmas. I didn't begin the journey of seeing the power and the meaning of Christmas till I started learning about the incarnation. The incarnation is God moving in to the bad neighborhood. 
If you ever bought a house, you tell your real estate agent, yeah, take us to the good part of town. Jesus said, where's the bad part of town? Where's the wrong side of the tracks? That's where I want to go. That is the incarnation. Now, if you were talking to someone on the streets of Portland or Gresham, because of our cultural ties to Christianity, the virgin birth and the birth of Jesus, it's kind of weird to people, but it's not really offensive to people. What's offensive to people is Jesus' resurrection. That's where it gets a little hairy in conversation. But what's funny is the rest of the world does not see things that way. For the rest of the world, this is the incarnation of Jesus that's the most offensive. The incarnation of Jesus is more offensive than the resurrection. Because to say incarnation is this, incarnate, it's in flesh. That's the root of this word. And when we say the word incarnation, what we are saying is this, that God became a man. I know you hear this every year, but what I just said is crazy. God became a man. Colossians 2, 9, Jesus, in Jesus, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. The glory of God, the creator of the cosmos, contained and constrained in human form. That is what we are talking about. The one who created the world, who longed for its beauty, its harmony, its presence with him, comes to the world that rejected him. From the very beginning. The infinite into the finite. As one author puts it, the Niagara into a teacup. Or for your sensibilities today, the Columbia into your Stanley. (laughs) That was a joke. You can laugh, yeah. I thought that would hit a little bit better for Gresham, okay? When I was a kid, my, my dad gave me a magnifying glass. And I was born in Texas, and we had big ants down there, okay? And I loved going outside, finding an ant hill, and using the sun to, well, play with the ants. (laughs) The incarnation is Jesus becoming an ant, and we are the ants. What do I need to say to break the cliches of Christmas language? God became a man. That is what we are celebrating every year. And the scandal of the incarnation, the thing that offends people when they say, when we say God became a man, the scandal is that a holy, good God would ever think about coming and experiencing our reality. So why would he do it? Why would God come here to redeem us? Have you ever thought about why wouldn't God just give up? (laughs) I would give up on us. The only thing that could ever explain God coming as a man is his great love for us. It is only the love of God that could move him to become a man in our experience. The offense of the incarnation is rooted in the love of the incarnation. God, who is above all, in all, and through all, decided to come and endure not just the cross, but the full human experience. Loneliness, betrayal, rejection, abuse, violation. Have you gone through it? So has Jesus. That is what Christmas is all about. What have you gone through? So has he. Humble love. Luke 2.7, this is our passage today. And Mary gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths, laid him in a manger because there was no place for him at the inn. The incarnation shows Jesus' humble love. Our verse today says, Jesus, there was no room for his mother or Joseph in the inn. Um, In reality, this is not a Motel 6 sign flashing no vacancy, okay? That's, That's not what's happening here. 
what is happening here is Jesus' parents are on the run from a government looking to kill their son. And they are likely arriving at a home connected to someone's extended family, whether on Mary's or Joseph's side. This is a deeply familial culture. It is very unlikely they are staying with strangers. Another layer that we miss here too is with the timeline of the census and the story we've all heard, it is actually very likely that they were staying with these family members for the end of the pregnancy season, not just the few days before Jesus is born. They were staying in a barn for months and they gave birth in a barn in a family home that made no room for them. Before Jesus is even born, he's being rejected by family. Why didn't God come like a conquering general? It would make more sense to me if God came like Genghis Khan, Napoleon, or if he ruled like Kim Jong-un. That makes more sense with my human experience. Why wouldn't he exert his force, his power, and his will over us? Instead, he chooses a way to come under us. Years ago, um, former President Obama visited Portland, and I didn't know he was coming to visit until I tried to drive to work. (laughs) And the whole city was shut down. I think a year or two ago, President Biden came and he visited the community center right down the hill from my house, which makes me really special. (laughs) Whenever a president comes to visit, there is a small army accompanying them. There's news coverage, there's protection, there's announcements. Crowds of people are clamoring to see this person. Jesus comes and no one sees him. He's born in a barn, unsanitary, unseen, hidden away. The heavenly realms know, Satan knows, but people pass him by. We live in a world based on views and likes, apps and currency that involves being seen. But the God of the universe comes and he's easy to miss. Grow your brand, grow your vlog, grow your thing by being seen. Jesus is born in a barn with no likes. Philip Yancey says this, unimaginably, the maker of all things shrank down, 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 so small as to become an ovum, a single fertilized egg barely visible to the naked eye, an egg that would divide and redivide until a fetus took shape, enlarging cell by cell inside a nervous teenager. Jesus is the humble God. He is the humble king. Those are oxymorons, by the way. The humble God, the humble king, but that is who we worship. There was no motorcade, no protection, no news coverage, no red carpet, no reception even in his own family. And make no mistake, the birth of Jesus divided history in half. We literally count years by the birth of this man 2,000 years ago. The angels in the heavenly heavenly realms were singing. Satan was clawing to find him and kill him, but we pass him by. Jesus comes not as a bloodthirsty king. He comes as a king to give his blood for the first time in human history, modeling power that way. There is no better quote for me that describes the power of the incarnation than Martin Luther King when he says, hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. Do you know it is the love of Jesus that brings his kingdom to earth? Love moves the kingdom of God here. And love is what moved Jesus to be born in our world. Jesus' love is humble and gentle. So the thing about Jesus that confuses us all sometimes is that he will never force himself upon you. 
He will never exert his power over you. Jesus' style is more gentle, loving invitation. And the greatest tragedy of Christmas is not your unbelieving coworkers saying happy holidays. It's not red cups at Starbucks. It's us in his kingdom forgetting to acknowledge the king of kings. But he is so loving that he will let us forget him year over year, time after time. His heart is the heart of invitation, not coercion, because he is the heart of love. He is love embodied. So my question for you today is, will you make room? Will you make room for Jesus this Christmas? I was sitting in the middle of goodness, asking myself, is this all there is? But it was when I started to model my Christmases after the heart of Jesus that they began to hold power. That it moved from a nice pageanty holiday to something that held meaning and emotion for me. I wanna to end today by giving us a few invitations that I think if we step into them, your Christmas will move from cliche to something more powerful. The first invitation I'd like to extend to you today is just speak about Jesus. Are you hosting family? Are you leading children through this holiday? Speak the name of Jesus. It is, I think, all about him this holiday. Can you imagine if I threw a birthday party for my kid and got so distracted with all the things for the birthday party for my kid that I didn't acknowledge and love and speak and honor my kid? I think that's what we do every year. Say the name of Jesus this holiday season. Say to your children, to your friends, to your coworkers, I'm so grateful to Jesus for X, Y, Z. Speak his name. The second I want to invite us to is to commit to one radical, uncomfortable act of generosity. Find someone in your family, your community, or here in your church who is in need and choose to radically move towards that need. That is the heart of the incarnation. Jesus seeing us in need and to his own peril, moving towards it. And last, make room for being with Jesus. Because Jesus didn't come and do all he did and release the Holy Spirit to be within us just as a show, he wants to be with us. Do we want to be with him? So I would encourage you above and beyond what you already do, make time, carve out an hour to sit in the quiet with the living God. Carve out an hour to read the gospel of Matthew or Luke to get this story in your bones. Carve out an hour to walk around your neighborhood and pray the authority and release of the kingdom of God over where you live. And let's begin to see what God might do in our community, in our place, in our time this Christmas. We are not celebrating a hallmark feel-good story. We are celebrating the King of Kings coming to redeem a deeply dark and broken world. Amen? That's what this is all about. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, would you come? Father, we just repent as a community that every year we are so tempted to be distracted and busy and get involved in all the things around you but miss you. And you want nothing more than to be with us. God, help us to model incarnate love this holiday season. This Advent, as we enter into the pain of waiting, would we see the pain of our neighbors in a deeper way? As we enter into generosity, would we see the generous heart you have always extended towards us? God, we want to sit at the table surrounded by goodness and also surrounded by the one who has given us everything. We long for your presence this Christmas and Advent season. 
Come, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name we pray.